Thank you, David, and thank you. Heartfelt thanks to the organizers of Camden Conference um, um, for bringing me here. It's just um, organizationally, this is a supreme effort. Um, I direct a center and putting together um, events of this kind is a very difficult task. So thank you all uh, for organizing this and thank you to the audience for coming. Um, I will tell the story of constricted souls and small minds um, in, in, a, in an empirical way, which is what I do. Both of us agree a lot, uh, Pratap and I. He comes to it through normative political theory and uses that to reflect on what's going on. And I am an empirical political scientist. And I use normative political theory advisedly rather than as the basis for. So you'll see a roughly similar story presented differently. <clears throat> um, here is the argument. India's democracy is recognized by theorists worldwide as historically exceptional, especially given its level of income. I'll say a little bit more about this. Uh, and Pratap was absolutely right. I mean, when India was born as a democracy, the literacy rate was 17%. 17%. There is no example in history where with 17% literacy, you had universal suffrage. But this claim applies mostly to India as an electoral democracy. India has functioned less well as a liberal democracy, and these gaps can be conceptualized as liberal deficits. India's recent record demonstrate that India's democratic evolution has reached a stage where the electoral and liberal aspects of democracy are now in a very, very deep conflict. India's electoral vibrancy, as you heard, continues, but the liberalism of its polity is seriously in decline. Elite choices based on values and ideologies and interests are central to understanding why India emerged and stabilized the democracy and why it's declining. And one way to summarize uh, the argument is to say that India's electoral democracy today can undermine its constitutional democracy. Or India's electoral democracy can undermine the liberal promise of the constitution. Hmm? Elections can undermine the constitution to put it very simply. <clears throat> and elections are required by the Constitution, but they can be used to undermine the Constitution. That's the argument. Um, here are some key elements of modern democratic theory. I think we should begin with that, rather than simply uh, uh, by putting, we should begin by putting India in the larger democratic theory perspective. <clears throat> Uh, basically, we say in, in my discipline, political science, there are two requirements of democracy, a minimum requirement and some broader requirements. The minimum requirement is elections. No elections, no democracy. <clears throat> and a broader requirement is elections plus the conduct of the polity and especially the government between elections. What happens between elections, those four or five years. And there, the liberal freedoms about which you've just heard or civil liberties, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association are, are vital, central. And after 1945, this will play a role in the argument, after 1945, we add minority protections or minority rights to these civil liberties also, these three liberal freedoms. Expression, freedom of expression, freedom of faith, and freedom of association. There is a, um, an income-based point in, in, in democratic theory, which is that democracies can be established at low levels of income, but they survive generally at high levels of income. The mortality rate of democracies is very high at low levels of income. <clears throat> and finally, uh, another empirical argument that holds uh, in, uh, the, in Global North who votes, the richer and the more educated the voter, the higher the odds of voting. It's a widely accepted empirical truth, if you will. <clears throat> now, let's look at India's electoral vibrancy. 
since 1952, 17 national elections. Power has changed hands eight times in Delhi and tens of times at the state level. Political scientists don't count anymore how many times power changes hands at the state level. It's just a regular feature. In 1952, 81 million votes were cast. In 2019, nearly 610 million votes were cast. And it probably will be 700 in May, in April and May, in the next, in the, in the next few months. Turnouts now routinely in excess of 60%, which America, incidentally, hasn't reached in the 20th century, 60% and above. Obama election came up to about 58, which was very high, very high for America. Um, uh, Mr. Trump has claimed that uh, 2019 was higher than ever. I don't think that's true. <clears throat> the last two elections, 2014 and 2019, had record turnouts over 65%. Narendra Modi has won two most participatory elections of Indian history when the turnout was in excess of 65%. Until 1989, following mainstream democratic theory, the richer and more educated citizens used to vote more than the poorer and the less educated. Since 1989, defying democratic theory, the poor and the less educated have voted as much as, if not more, than their more fortunate co-citizens. A plebeian turn in India's democratic evolution arrived over the last 40 years, last 30 years, last 30 years. <clears throat> and here is the, the comparison. This is the Indian line. Uh, the higher you are, the better your performance over time. This is the North American, Western European line. India has been basically, over its history, below only the North American and West European line, even though its income is a fraction of the income of North America and Western Europe, right? And of late, you can see the decline. This, after 19, 2014, you can see the decline. Other lines are not very relevant here. These are, there's an all-world line, there is an Asia line. But basically, the more important point here is that Indian democratic performance here is only, except in the first few years when it is higher than the North American line, blacks got the right to vote basically in 1965 after losing the, the right to vote in the American South for, under Jim Crow. So uh, Robert Dahl, the great democratic theorist, says that India, Indian democracy between 1950 and 1965 was ahead of American democracy because blacks got their vote back after the 15th Constitutional Amendment of 1870, only in 1965 in the South. Hmm? Okay, so that's, the, that's the, 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 uh, the summary of the electoral vibrancy. Now, um, on income, maybe a, a minute on that. Uh, the most remarkable data set is produced by a very distinguished senior political scientist, uh, now retired, Adam Shuvorsky of NYU. <clears throat> the data set covered 141 countries between 1950 and 1990, and statistically, we could, he could show that income predicted 77.5% of the cases. No other predictor of democratic longevity was as good as income. Ethnic, uh, ethnic diversity, international political environment, colonial legacy, religion. So income didn't predict everything, but predicted 77.5% of the variation, right? India is in the latter 22.5% uh, 22 uh, set. And there's only the following countries in that. India, Mauritius, Belize, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu, which is probably 123,000 people or so, right? Um, and then he concludes, he concludes, the most surprising case is India, to quote this, the, perhaps the, the biggest empirical project on, uh, undertaken in democracy, uh, and, and relationship between dem democracy and development, the odds against democracy in India were extremely high. And it adds that Singapore is the exception on the other side. No high, non-oil, no non-oil high-income country is undemocratic except Singapore. 
Singapore's per capita income is today $2,000 higher than the United States. It is richer than the United States, according to the IMF and the World Bank, per capita income. But it's undemocratic. <clears throat> okay, now from elections to the idea of liberal deficits, or from electoral to liberal democracy. As you heard, standard in liberal freedoms common to virtually all varieties of at least post-1945 post liberalism is freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, freedom of association, and minority rights. Why are these important? Once the minimum criteria of contestation and participation, which is electoral, are satisfied that a democracy can attain higher quality, meaning it can become deeper if liberal freedoms between elections are available, if citizens are free to speak, free to associate, free to practice their faith. So we cannot have a democracy without free elections, but a democracy would be deeper if non-electoral dimensions of freedom, not simply free vote, were also available. Now, Pratap made a very important point. If you start attacking liberal freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of religious faith, then will elections also not be attacked at some point? This is an important question, and it will be tested soon. But in principle, you can separate the two. In principle, you can separate. Well, practically, this will be the attack on liberal freedoms will be extended to electoral freedoms, or the electoral, the sanctity of the electoral process will be tested. <clears throat> um, okay, here is a special case of minority rights. This is this is a, appeared in liberal th uh, theory after 1945 very prominently, and we can understand why. All post-1945 democracies are not only based on the idea of power stemming from electoral majorities, which will define like, whoever wins the election, runs the government, has power, but also on minority protections now a requirement. Majorities can protect themselves by their numerical weight. Minorities don't have the numbers. Hence, minority rights always constitutionally protected in, in modern democracies. Without minority protections, democracy can become a brute majoritarian force. Example, Nazi Germany and Jim Crow American South. <clears throat> Carl Schmitt, a German legal theorist who ended up joining the Nazis, drew a distinction between democracy and liberalism. Democracy was about expression of majority wishes. Liberalism meant for him protection of individual freedoms and minority rights. Jews in Germany, he argued could be protected under liberalism, but not under democracy. If majority of Germans wanted Jews restricted, expelled, or even killed, that's a democratic wish. Please note, and he ended up, the, the, one of the greatest legal theory, political and legal theories of the 1920s ended up joining the Nazis on this ground. And he didn't think liberalism was the way to rebuild Germany. Democracy was the way to rebuild Germany. This distinction, therefore, was given up after the anti-Jewish horrors of Europe in the 1930s and 40s. All post-1945 democracies now tend to have rights for religious, racial, ethnic minorities built into their political fabric. You, you draw this distinction, you create very serious problems, as Pratap just pointed out. Very serious problems. Once you draw this distinction between liberalism, and it can be done, but practically, this means a lot of violence, disaster, horrors. Um, liberal freedoms in India. India is freest at the time of elections, short of inciting violence. Virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. Uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi in 2019 campaigned on the Prime Minister is a thief slogan. Chokidar Chor hai. Prime Minister is a thief. That was a slogan on which he campaigned. So it's freest at the time of elections, and we'll see whether it remains true in April and May, coming April and May. But once an elected government takes over, restrictions on basic liberties are often placed. Intellectuals, writers, artists, journalists, professors, students, NGOs can face harassment on grounds that they hurt sentiments of certain groups or undermine national interest. 
These, are, these problems are common to all kinds of government. Examples, Rushdi's satanic verses was first banned in India under Congress rule because of Muslim right. And also under Congress party, M.F. Hussain had to migrate to, had to leave India, famous painter, because of Hindu right. Muslim right made satanic verses virtually impossible and Hindu right made M.F. Hussain's paintings or his continuance virtually impossible. But these problems become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power, as is true since 2014. Why? Minorities automatically get added to the list of targets, not simply writers or, or artists. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to that. India for Hindu nationalists is primarily a Hindu nation, which is a fundamentally, as you heard, unconstitutional idea. Much like the idea that America is a white nation. Mm -hmm. While that's been politically believed in, you know, in American history in many parts, that's not a, a constitutional idea. <clears throat> now, the most important target, the most important target of Hindu nationalists historically and today is the Muslim minority of India. Every Hindu nationalist text, starting from 1925, makes that case. Riots used to be the principal form of communal violence. Riots have declined since the mid-1990s. Since 2014, however, a relatively new form of communal violence has emerged, lynching. Another familiar thing from Jim Crow South. Muslims are its main victims. Here is data. So, this is... This is the this is number of deaths. This is the frequency of lynchings. This is the year. After 2014, you can see the rise in lynchings. And who are the principal victims? After 2014, this line is the vic Muslim victims. This line is the Hindu victim. This line is Christian victims. So it's not that only Muslims are targeted. That's not the case that this data makes. This data makes the case that Muslims are targeted much, much more, many times more than Hindus and Christians in, in, in lynchings. And of course, they are only 14 to 15 percent of India. Mm? And Christians are 2 percent of India and Hindus are roughly 80 percent of India. So this distribution is very different from demographic distribution. That establishes the case for targets. The population that is 14 to 15 percent of India is lynched many times more. The ostensible aim of lynchings is to prevent the eating of beef and production of and selling of cow meat. Premised on the claim that cows are sacred to many Hindus, beef eating, though beef, beef is eaten by Hindus in eastern southern India. To prevent Hindu conversion to Islam, premised on the claim that such conversion is always promoted by coercion, deceit, or material temptation. To prevent young Muslim men from marrying Hindu women, not to prevent Hindu men from marrying Muslim women, but pre prevent young Muslim men from marrying Hindu women, premised on the claim that these are aimed at increasing the size of Muslim population, which if not stopped now would eventually overwhelm the Hindu population. Statistically impossible. 14% cannot become 51% in, the, in a matter of three, four, five, six, seven decades. Even 100 years would not be able to do that. But the statistics doesn't matter in this claim. 14% hmm? will become, through the, through, through the method of marrying Hindu women, 14% will become 54%. Hard not to infer that the fundamental aim of lynchings is establishment of Hindu primacy and reduction of Muslims to the status of second, uh, secondary citizens. Now, um, uh, some of us uh, are involved in reconstructing empirical democratic theory and emphasizing on elite choices, elite behavior, and elite ideologies as opposed to income level, as opposed to inequality, as opposed to ethnic diversity, as opposed to some other structural characteristics. We really want elite behavior, political parties back at the center of democratic analysis not these some structural conditions, objective conditions. 
And if we go do that, which some of us have started doing, and the, uh, the first edited volume is already out on that, and much more work is being done. The focus on elites then can be divided into three parts, the founding moment and the formative period of Indian democracy, the period since the only nationwide breakdown, 75, 77, until 2014, and the period since 2014. In the first period, elite values played a big role in institutionalizing democracy. I've gone through the constituent assembly debates. On universal suffrage, I found only seven people arguing with some trepidation and with some, no one is arguing against democracy. On universal suffrage, only seven objections were raised in a, an assembly of 299, I think, uh, uh, constituent assembly, and they were dropped. Hmm? There was widespread agreement among the elites of India that there should be universal suffrage, despite 17% literacy rate, despite one of the lowest incomes in the world, per capita incomes in the world, and, and, and democracy will be central to everything Indian polity does, everything Indian economy does. Democracy will not be suspended for reasons of economic development. Democracy will not be suspended if wars take place, etc., etc. In the second period, I argue, this is not important here, why values explain a lot, but serious interests also developed in the continuance of democracy. Here is the most important part. While dealing with the recent decline in liberal aspects of democracy, the most important thing to note is that Hindu nationalism is the guiding ideology of those in power in Delhi and in half of India's states, not all of India's states. That ideology says that India is a Hindu nation, and then I'm using my words very carefully, a truth that the constitution and post-independence polity wrongly and unjustly denied. Hindu nationalists did not accept India's constitution to begin with. Did not. Hmm? Further, according to this ideology, Muslims cannot be equal to Hindus. Hindus are the original owners of India as a nation and Muslims have been disloyal to India. Indeed, the Delhi Sultanate, 1206 to 1526, and Mughal Empire, 1526-17, were equal to colonialism. Colonialism did not begin with the British occupation of India. This is a very remarkable historical claim. No professional historian ever agreed with this claim. They all argued that colonialism began with British occupation of India. Hindu nationalists say colonialism began at least in 1206 when Delhi Sultanate, which is Muslim rule, was established and possibly since 7-11, 7-11 when, when, when Sindh, now part of Pakistan, at that point part of India, was first conquered by, by the general of Umayyad Caliphate. <clears throat> at the deepest philosophical level, the idea is that rights should not be given on an individual basis, which is how rights are conceptualized in a modern democracy. Rather, rights should be assigned on a community basis. Communities that have historically contributed more to India or communities that have been more loyal to India should have superior bundle of rights. What is equal rights? That doesn't make sense according to them. How can Muslims and Hindus be equal in India? They can be. You know, Muslims can have whatever rights they have in, in, the, in the Middle East, but not. they cannot be equal to Hindus in India. Even in principle, let alone in practice, the notion violates the idea of citizen equality without which modern democracy cannot function. The biggest move towards Hindu supremacy, as Pratap has already mentioned, was made on January 22nd this year in the temple consecration in Ayodhya. It was court approved. What the court, I don't think the court approved that the prime minister should be consecrating. Court simply said the, 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 the temple should be built. They did say that. The court approved the building and consecration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya as the biggest symbolic and discursive move towards Hindu supremacy in post-47 India. Why? Violating a core commitment of India's constitution, namely religious neutrality. India's prime minister, along with two other constitutional authorities, consecrated a Hindu temple in a huge state-sponsored occasion. The chief of the RSS, the mother organization of Hindu nationalism, was seated next to the prime minister. The founding, the founding institution of Hindu nationalism, Rashtri Swayam Sevak Sangh, its chief was seated next to the India's highest constitutional or second highest constitutional authority, the prime minister of India. 
The rhetoric of PM Modi's speech openly displayed the new ideology. And I'm, I'll say something in Hindi, those who know Hindi. Ram se Raj or Niti Tak, which essentially means Ram, Lord Ram, Hindu Lord Ram as the basis of statecraft. Niti or Ram se Raj Tak, Ram se Niti Tak. Then another thing that we've been discussing in our group, Ram se Rashtri Chetra ka Vikas, Lord Ram, Hindu Lord Ram, as a medium for the spread of national consciousness. The, the freedom movement had a different concept of national consciousness. That freedom movement and its concept of national consciousness and national identity anchored in the constitution of India is to be changed, to be altered fundamentally. If Modi wins again in May 2024, the most important question will be what laws will be brought in through parliament to give the idea of Hindu supremacy legal foundations. Discursively, it's happening. Symbolically, it's happening. What laws will be brought in? Some have been brought in already. They've not been impl implemented yet, but what laws will be brought in? Will India, or at least the BJP-dominated states, that's half of India, have a Jim Crow-style legal order not, of course, for white supremacy, but for Hindu supremacy, all ostensibly electorally legitimated. That is the very big paradox here. Ele electoral democracy now has the potential for undermining the constitutional order. India's electoral democracy and constitutional democracy are now fundamentally at odds. So I think I'm done. Uh, my time is up. My time is up. You've heard uh, an account here from both of us, which is roughly the same. Presented differently is a roughly the same account. Okay. Thank you.